uh, the hardship of my family had. And so it was of many families in the late 30s, very, very difficult, depression time, the big depression. And uh, later on when the war broke out, there was so much work for everybody, the depression broke and my family was working. I wasn't, I was still a kid. And, uh, and my brother was still a kid, but my sister, my mother, and my father worked. My father and mother worked in the woolen mills and my sister worked in a shoe factory. And that helped us get out of the slum area of Lawrence, very bad slum area. And uh, we moved up in the hill, which was a lovely airy house and nice little garden. And I remember that being a turning point in my life, that there were better things than a tenement with uh, hardship and, and roaches and uh, rubbish pails right below your window without lids. So it was, a, it was a, a big happiness for all of us to move in a nicer house with hot running water, which the other one didn't have, and tub which my mother made a big thing of. When you're small, you don't, but my mother made a big thing about not having a tub. Oh, my father was the cook. Unlike a lot of families where the mother cooks, opposite with my father, which is in a lot of Italian families, which I discovered later on in life. A lot of Italian families, the father cooks. He marketed, he prepared the food, he cooked it, and he did it with such lust that as a kid watching him impressed me. And I think that's where my love for cooking came in, just watching him cut and dice and chop and smell and eat, everything. Food was a religion to him. And um, uh, just, as I said, just watching him was was a thrill for me. As little as I was, I used to get a big kick out of watching him. Oh, my mother and father argued constantly, but so did many of the other families there, which was, the stem was poverty. When you're poor, you take it out on each other because you don't know what else to do. A lot of men used to drink and walk out of the fam, my father was a homebody. There was a, an Italian men's club, but he didn't go to it because he'd say, I can't afford a beer and I can't afford gambling. Why should I go? I can't even afford a cheap glass of wine. So why should I go? So he would, you know, read the newspaper. We had two newspapers, the Progresso, an Italian paper, and the Eagle Tribune, which was the daily American paper. And he would read both. He was bilingual. He was very good. He had been in the military for four years, so he knew how to speak and, and read English very well. And, uh, but they argued bitterly. But they made up quickly, too. It was nice to see. It was very nice to see. After a couple of hours of arguing and all, sometimes they'd go out for a little walk around the, the park, which was called the Common. In Massachusetts, a park is called the Common. And, uh, you know, for common people. And um, they'd come home, and you'd see them together, uh, frying eggs with uh, sardines and uh, Italian bread, which smelled like heaven. And they would be talking and eating as if nothing had happened previously which surprised my sister and I, who were in our rooms, we'd say, you know, there was, there was hell here a couple of hours ago. Look at them. And we'd go to bed more peacefully because they had made up. But after a while, we learned to know who they were. Yeah. My brother Busty was aloof towards all of it. Maybe because he didn't have a brother. You know, sisters can cling together, brothers cling together, but he didn't have a brother. So he was envious of my sister and I being as close as we were. So he had friends, but he couldn't confide in anybody the way we confided in each other, my sister and I. So um, 
but he had friends that he'd go to, and they were, everybody was in the same boat. I gotta tell you about Common Street, as, as ugly as the places it was to live, the people were wonderful. They were all struggling to survive. Nobody stole from each other. We had a basement, and every family, there were six families to a house. Each family had a small cubby hole to store their personal things, luggage, if they jarred tomatoes or things like that. Nobody stole or touched each other's property. And they were very kind to each other. Uh, one time I taught this woman how to read because she had to get her, her, um, her uh, citizenship and she had to learn how to read so that she could learn the rules, the laws that you have to know by heart in order to pass your citizenship. And so I was in the third grade and with you know uh, the little simple books that they were, it was easy for me to teach her. And she was wonderful. She'd come every night and for about an hour I was her tutor. Well, she did pass her citizenship paper, it was wonderful. The, the, the attorney said, the law, the judge rather, the judge said to her, asked her, who's the president of the United States? She said, Presidente Roosevelt. She said, he asked her, who freed the slave? Abraham Lincoln. He says, who was the first president of the United States? George Washington, God bless him. So he said, he banged his mallet on the desk and he says, you're a citizen. He saw how much he wanted to be a citizen. And she passed, and so when she passed, she brought me an adorable little dress, which I knew was a struggle for them. My parents were almost embarrassed. They had more children than my father and mother had, but still, that's the kind of people they were. Lovely, lovely people. I missed them when I moved up in the hill with the tree, the cherry tree, the grass, the, the swing, and you know the, the tub and the hot water, but I missed them. They were very, very nice people. When the war broke out, there was work. See, it was because there were no orders for the woolen mills or the shoe factories that they would lay people off. Um, and so when each layoff, naturally there wasn't any money coming in. But when the war broke out, there were orders. So they worked and they brought in a full paycheck. Well, that's when we saw the light of day. And that's when my mother says, let's get out of here. We want hot water. We want a tub. We want to get away from the roaches and the dirty trash bag barrels downstairs. Let's go. So that summer I turned 12 and we moved out of there. Because we moved in there when I was seven. We had come from New York. Uh, that's where my father had found work, to be near my mother's family. My father didn't have anybody. He had left everybody in Italy and at 14 years old. But my mother, who had come at 13, and had, and, and because her father was in America, first the father came, then she came, and then seven years later, she, her mother and her three sisters. My mother now is 18 years old. She had missed all that time with her mother and sisters. It was hard, they all were boarders. She was boarding at her aunt's house, my, my grandmother's sister's house. She was a boarder there. And she had missed out on being with her family. So now she was married with children. She wanted to be near her family. And my father was working, but with the depression, he couldn't find work. So his friend said to him, there's work in Lawrence, there's work. So he believed him, and there was at the time my, his friend wrote to him. But when we arrived in Lawrence, there wasn't work. So it was very, very bad times, very bad. We had credit with the milkman, the grocer, the, the butcher, the, the bread bakery. It was pretty bad. And I remember my father saying, we will never move from here unless everybody's paid off, which happened. That summer, we paid everybody off, and then we moved. 
the honor was great. And the, you know, it was a wonderful thing to be brought up with that kind of honor. So that was my childhood. When my mother and father were newlyweds, they had went, they went to visit a couple they knew that had bought a piece of property in Methuen, out in the outskirts of Methuen, Mass. And they saw this little shack with a well and a, and a cellar, and it was just a room with a little kitchen. Kitchen had a big black iron stove, and my mother and father thought, oh, wouldn't this be great to spend from all spring and all summer here until Labor Day, because that's when the snow happens in Massachusetts. So that couple was telling them, oh yes, we arrive here in sort of the end of May, and we have every weekend here, and our vacation when we get it, even when times are bad and we're not working, we come over here. And um, there's a, a milk farm up the hill, and we get our fresh milk every day. I remember her name was Emily, and she would milk the cows and give us our milk in a, in a metal container. I remember it was so interesting because I didn't realize about pasteurization in those days. I was just seven, eight, nine. So she used to sieve the milk in a piece of cheesecloth into our container, from her container with a piece, of, and there was a lot of hair and remnants and she'd say, enjoy, enjoy, we'd go home. I think it was like a dime. And so when we arrived home at the farm, I'll tell you about that in a minute, my mother would boil it. And she would say, it's to call a pasteurization. <laughs> and I learned very quickly about pasteurization. She says, because, she says, because your father's first wife died of tuberculosis. And one of the reasons was milk wasn't pasteurized in those days. And even the, the reason we didn't pasteurize our, rather boil our water was it came out of a fresh well. And later on in years, I found out that my father had, uh, had a, an eel in the, uh, a couple of eels in the uh, well. It's to keep it clean. The eel would eat the, the, yeah. the remnants of whatever was in there. There's the, he never told us. We wouldn't have drank the water. So they, they had little money, but what, hap and though, what happened was if a couple wanted to build, the first thing they did was buy the, the lot of land. And I think I remember it being three lots. And then all the neighbors, whoever wanted to build one or had built one themselves, came and did all the work. They never paid any laborers. Everything was done by the neighbors themselves. They all knew each other from Italy. They had all come from in, to America, some together, some in different times, but they had all come from Sicily, Italy. That was a Sicilian area, that one. There would be areas that would be Neapolitan, and there would be some Calabresi, but we were Sicilian. And so that area was all Sicilian, and they all knew each other from the old country. And so um, they all got together and dug a well. That's the first thing you do. You dig a well for the water, otherwise you can't build with the mortar and the cement and the bricks. And, um, and then they dug a basement. We had a, a, a nice basement. If we wanted things to stay cool, we put it in the cool basement. And it always smelled of cool, musty wine because my father always made wine in the summertime, it was lovely. He made it. Yeah, he made his own wine. Crushed the grapes, the big barrel, big barrel with a, a hand, uh, you know, the faucet coming out with a little handle. And he'd say to us, don't drink it until we close up the farm because it's got to ferment. But we kids never listened. So we'd go down there, sneak it, and it oh, tasted just like pink champagne. It would come out pink and it had sweet, and so he'd tip the barrel sometimes, he'd say, he'd yell, who's, who's been at the wine? Well, I don't know, we don't know. I don't know, it was you, no, not me. He knew, he knew. And um, so they built the, this little uh, 
the the room was I would say maybe um, uh, twenty by twenty. It fit two big, two regular sized beds, a bureau, and a trunk. Everybody had a trunk in those days that they brought with them from the old country, which held the blankets and the sheets and things, and a couple of chairs. And then later on, my father, by himself now, with his cousin, who was a carpenter, uh, built a kitchen with a black stove, a black iron stove, a uh, cast iron black stove. And um, the recipes and the cooking that he made out of that stove were enough to boggle your mind. The, the aroma, that when he'd pick the fresh corn in the morning and boil it, we'd, uh, we'd awaken to the fresh smell of corn in a pot this big. And we'd each, we kids, would each have three cobs. My brother used to have five, you know with melted butter on top. It was, it was so good, it was so good. He'd make pizza and uh, uh, thing called Oda Oda, which is in my cookbook that later on I wrote. And um, delicious food, just delicious. And um, so we, there was this house and it didn't have a porch. It just had a covering with a pole and my father used to say, my desire is to have a closed and screened in porch. That's my desire. Before I die, I gotta add that. Later on in years, no, I was in my teens, that my cousin I told you was a, was a carpenter. His daughter married a carpenter. He built us a porch, a screened in porch. And my father had all that family come over and all of us, and he made he made order orders, which is a, um, an empanada, really. That's what it is. And pizza, and everything in the salad was picked fresh from the garden. And we had two apple trees, a pear tree, and a plum tree. And I wanted a peach tree so badly, but my father said, we just don't have one, and we don't even have the room anymore for another tree, because trees take up a lot of space and give shadow. You know? So the, the earth has to have the sun to grow everything. He said, better that we have fresh vegetables and things for the summer. So, But I said to him once, you know what I love? I love those bar the, the brown pears. I don't know what they, what are those brown pears Bar called? Bar bar I think, are you sure? Bar the brown? Bosk. Bosk pears. And he said, I know what to do. So we had a Bartlett tree, the yellow one. So he spliced the tree with the bark of the, of the boss tree, of the boss tree to the Bartlett tree. And he said, it won't be completely the brown pear, the boss pear, but it'll have that flavor. And I saw him put a wedge of, he smoothed, he wedged it and he hammered it into the tree and the next season, we had this duo taste tree. It was wonderful. The relationship between my sister and I is very close, has been since I was born and exists until today. Um, Connie is seven years older than I am, but We've always been the best of friends. She's confided in me and I in her about everything and anything. So she, when she went to work in the shoe factories, she made good money. And um, when I was working for a clothing factory and also as a, as a bookkeeper, I didn't make much money. There were better places to work but I didn't make enough money. Now being in my 20s, late teens and 20s, I wanted better money. So I went to work where she worked. It's a terrible place. It was sort of what they call midway to slavery. You know, benches with girls aligned with a machine, and you work piecework. You work, you got paid in how much how many cases of shoes you, sit, you stitched. 
there were 36 pair of shoes to a case. So you had a hustle to make your money. I was never as fast as my sister was. She had worked many years more than I did. She was so wonderful. At the end of the day, she'd say to me, how many numbers do you have? And I'd say, I've got five. She says, take two of mine so that I looked good to the foreman and they would keep me. And uh, that way she had me next to her <laughs> and I next to her. So it was wonderful. So we made the best of it. So those years, I decided to join a dramatic group that opened up in our hometown. And it was called Lawrence Theater Group. And uh, uh, I joined it, and then she joined it too. So we were in place together. It was a lot of fun. It was an escape from the, the, the misery of working in the shoe factory. The, the ladies' room was so bad, it had gnats flying around it. So we'd hurry up to use it and hurry back. And it was just, just terrible. And um, anyway, so, and then I joined a choral group because I had a good voice. So I joined a choral group and it's all in my albums here, uh, little pieces of vignettes of those times. And uh, the memories come back when you look at those pictures. And um, it was fun. So I was in a dramatic group and a choral group. She didn't join the choral group with me. She said the dramatic group was enough for her. <laughs> she says, that's enough kooks I wanna meet. So, well, you know, dramatic people are, tend to be kooky. So, um, and, and anyway, but it was fun. And I was in some musicals, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and so one day, we were at an Italian feast that takes place in any Italian area. You find that there's an Italian feast that takes place. And it was the Feast of Three Saints. And... Phil, Philadelphia, and Chirino. Uh, and uh, those were Italian names. And you see the three saints, and the altar boys would be carrying the three saints through the streets. But a bum, but a bum, but a bum, you know, the music would go on, and everybody was so, and they'd had the best food in the world sausage sandwiches, meatballs with sauce, uh, crispelli, which are pieces of dough with either ricotta inside or anchovy, either one, and the hot off the fat and, and eat it in the street. Things like that never tasted as good as they did in the street. And, um, and we bumped into a girlfriend we knew, a girl we knew. And we asked, she asked about us, and we asked about her. She said, I'm in the Air Force. She said, I'm in civi civilian clothes because I'm here, but I'm in the Air Force. The Air Force? What ever made you join the Air Force? She said, I got tired of being in a small town. I wanted to travel. I wanted to see other things. And so, well, you know, good night, good night, bye-bye. And Connie and I were very quiet that night walking home. And... When we got into our rooms, I closed the door. <laughs> and I said, what do you think about us joining the Air Force? She said, I think it's a fetched idea. She says, you know, we, our pays are helping our parents. I said, we get paid there. We could send them money every month. She said, yeah, but she said, did you notice what she said the pay was? $90 a month. I said, yeah, but you get, your rent is free, your food is free. And, you know, I said, you gotta consider that. Well, she said, let's go and see what it's all about. So the following week, we went to the recruiting station and she was there. She had become a recruiting sergeant in Lawrence. That's how come she was at the feast. So she told us all about it and she convinced us. We were dying for something new and different and exciting. We needed it. We did, we really needed it. So we joined up, but just before joining up, we broke the news to our parents. My mother took it bad, but my father didn't. My father had been in the military. As far as my father was concerned, he was sorry he hadn't stayed. And he often said that to us. I should have stayed in the army. So my mother took it bad. But my father said, you girls have done so much for us, and I know you want to have an adventure, and you're together. 
He says, that's why I like this, because you're together. And stay together. Wherever they tell you to go, you say, we want it, but we want to stay together. He says, it'll be safer that way. We took his advice because we did. We did stay together. We went to the same school together. We, uh, we became um, supply technicians. Yeah. First we did our, our, our basic training in Texas. Then we went to Wyoming for our school, three months of school of, uh, of learning how to be a supply technician. And then we were sent to Florida, to all together. They just kept us together. How old were you? I was 23 and Connie was 30. And did you like it? I loved it. I loved it. She was out of Lawrence. I loved it. It was so exciting. Even the marching and the songs and the excitement and meeting those girls from all over the country. The songs while all marching? All over the country. The songs while marching? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, the chicken in the Air Force, they say, is mighty fine. But one jumped off the table and started marching time. Oh, I don't want no more of Air Force life. Gee, Mom, I want to go, but they won't let me go. Gee, Mom, I want to go home. <laughs> and we'd break up laughing. And the sergeant who was telling us, you know, to march, hip, right, stop laughing, hip, you Chicago sisters, stop laughing. And we, you know, because you do this when you're laughing, your heads have got to be straight like that. It's so much fun. Then we'd sing Alouette, Janta Alouette. It was so much fun. And the freedom, the freedom of not answering to your mother and father was incredible. I mean, they watched us like hawks. 11 o'clock came, if we weren't home, holy cow. Not that they ever, ever put a hand to us, but we got it verbally. So... Did you sing it all in the military? Oh, yeah. What happened is, what happened is, at the end of your basic training, there's a show. You put on a show. Let's put on a show. And um, my sergeant came up to me. She says, I've heard you sing for the girls here. You've got a beautiful voice. Why don't you be in the show? I said, okay, so I I sang in the show. I sang um, "Bluebird of Happiness," and the house came down. I was thrilled, and I won the contest. I won the contest, and then I when I went to Wyoming, I was singing for the Air Force Orchestra, and I sang for um, the commissioned officers club with the Air Force Band. It's very very exciting. Every Saturday I sang with the orchestra, you know, popular numbers, and it was, and I got paid. So that was extra money I made. I didn't say that before we left for the military, my mother and father said, you have to send us each $30 a piece, otherwise we can't pay the mortgage. And we, we signed a paper that, yes, and we did. So when we joined up, we told them to take it out, remove it from our pay, you know, garnish our pay and send it home. So we never even saw the $30 that we sent home each. So naturally, we were just left with 60 a month, you know. And believe me, it's a good thing we shared each other's clothes, which we were used to before anyway. We always shared each other. Once I grew up, we started sharing each other's clothes. Once, once you're a teenager and you develop, then you can share your sister's clothes who's, who's, who's been built seven years prior to you. Then when we were shipped to um, Florida, that was the end of the music career. And I didn't know then, in later years I thought of it, I should have gone down and asked for um, a special... Um, um, special service, that's what they called it. That's the entertainment group. I could have gotten into special service. I didn't know when the job ended in Wyoming with the band and we were shipped to, Wy to Florida to actually work as technicians, supply technicians, I didn't think about it or know about it. Later on in years, I learned about that. So, if you had done that, would it not also been the end of you and Connie being together? No, because in Florida they had entertainment also. So we would have been in the same base. But I would have not done uh, supply. I would have done entertainment, you know. So, But I didn't know it then. It's okay. 
So I, I learned a lot from supply technician. You learn a, you learn you learn how the military is run, the the trucks and the cars and the planes and the things they need, and that's what we used to do. We used to order. That, that's what a supply technician does. They order the supplies that each division needs in the, mili in the base that they're in. And uh, I met a lot of nice people. It's funny, when I joined the service, in my head, I thought it was going to be working with women because you joined the Women's Air Force. My sister later on told me, no, she knew it was all men, but she didn't say anything about it, so we didn't communicate that with each other. So... It was a surprise to me that it was all men we work with because, as I said, I thought it was women's Air Force. But um, you learn how to get along. Sometimes there was one or two that weren't very nice. But there was one time, one job I had where my, uh, my master sergeant was, was actually sexually harassing me, telling me he wouldn't promote me unless I stayed, with, I slept with him. And I said to him, never. So um, I went to see my officer, my woman officer. I remember her name was Colonel Temple. She was wonderful. She listened to my story, and she said, in two days, you'll receive papers, orders, that you're going to be shipped to another office. And that office, there are more civilians working than military. You'll like it. And I did, and I got my corporal, I got to be corporal there, and they liked me, and I liked them, and it was just that he was a pig. But the rest of the guys were wonderful in the office. It was hard to say goodbye to them, but I wanted to get promoted. I needed the money badly. When I got to Florida, um, I was having a coke with my girlfriend in the, um, in the rec room and the recreation room. They, sell, they used to sell hamburgers and hot dogs and coke and you could just sit there and have a refreshment after work. And I was sitting with my girlfriend and I see, I see three young boys, they're all in civvies. Once you get out of work, you go into civilian clothes. And it's warm in Florida. So everybody had Hawaiian shirts, you know, and very cool dresses. And um, they came forward towards us. And one of them was tall. And he turned his chair around and sat sort of saddle, saddle type. And he just looked at me. <coughs> and he was so handsome. He looked like Mario Lanza. That's, that's, that's what he looked like. And he said to me, what's a Jewish girl doing in the, in, the, in the Air Force? And I realized I had a nose that looked Italian. And I said to him, because he looked like Mario Lanza, what's an Italian boy doing in the Air Force? And he said, I'm not. And I said, I'm not. <laughs> we started to laugh. And we hit it off. And we went for a walk on the beach. And we talked about music we liked. And... We had a lot in common. He was very bright, very kind, very respectful, very nice. A refreshing, wonderful, intelligent guy. And anyway, we fell in love. And uh, in two months, we were married. Because you see each other every day. It's concentrated courting. So we got married, so I needed the money. And that's why I wanted to become corporal so badly. Because we wanted to buy ourselves just a little bit of furniture, not much. Because you rent an apartment. Some of them came furnished, some of them didn't. The ones that didn't come furnished were cheaper. So we wanted to go into a cheaper apartment and be able to, to get a bed, a bureau. We didn't even get a couch. I remember he picked up an old mattress from the from one of the his friends he knew and we had it on the floor with a cover on top and that was our couch but we did have a radio that was the first thing we bought was a radio i remember the first thing we bought was a radio with a recorder two candlesticks because i was thought it was romantic to sit in our little bridge table with two candlesticks lit 
and um, and four mugs. <laughs> it's funny the things you remember. The first purchase we ever made, and so and that's what we bought was a bridge table with four chairs, and that was our table. And I started to cook then, and he loved all my Italian cooking, which I had learned from my father. And uh, he taught me some, he was Jewish, and he told me on our second date that he was Jewish. And did it bother me? I said, no, I, I know many Jewish families. They lived next to us when we lived in New York City. I remember their Friday nights, they used to ask me to come and shut off their their gas jets and their electric lights because after sunset, you can't do that anymore. You can't touch anything, uh, utility-wise. Uh, utility and uh, so he was. He thought that was amazing that he would meet somebody who knew, although he wasn't orthodox. He wasn't at all. He was um, uh, reform, a reformed Jew. And, uh, but when I talked about my own religion being Protestant, unlike a lot of Catholics that are, uh, excuse me, Italians that are Catholic, he wanted to know about that. And I told him how my parents, when they were in New York City, they wanted to go to church, but the church was very, very far. My father didn't, mother didn't have a car. Everybody took the subway or the bus. And, uh, but there was a Protestant church just down the street, uh, Presbyterian. And uh, so my mother and father went for a couple of services. They liked it so much. They used to have an Italian service on a Sunday night. And then they also took care of the children in a sort of a nursery or a teenage, which was for my sister and my brother. They had, uh, you know, things that would occupy teenagers and took care of the children. And so it was very convenient for them. Not only did they have their sermon in Italian, but their children were taken care of. And so Sunday mornings were for the family. Sunday nights were if they wanted to hear the sermon in Italian. And even the songs were all Italian. Until this day, I know the Italian hymns because my mother would sing them in the, around the house. And um, so that's how come we became Presbyterian. Down each avenue of the street of stars. What happened with my sister, I was at the reform service with Jake. That's his name. His name was Harry Lewis Jacobson. And everybody called him Jake for Jacobson. And uh, we were at, at one of his services uh, because it was close to uh, Hanukkah. No, not Hanukkah, Rosh Hashanah, because that's in September, and that's the new year. And so he said, let's go. It's going to be a nice service. So we went, and uh, um, the rabbi was saying, after service, there's going to be refreshments in the back room, so everybody please stay. But next to me, I noticed this man uh, sort of watching the two of us. We were... There was Jake, myself, and then there was this young man. And uh, I was wondering why he was watching the two of us. And I was singing phonetically Hebrew, but the words are written down phonetically. So I was singing because I love to sing, and Jake was so proud. So the service was over, and he turned to me and said, I've seen you before, but not you. I said, I have a sister here. <laughs> I have a sister that's with me. He said, you joined up with your sister? I said, yeah. He said, oh, that's amazing. And so when we went for refreshments, he asked me about me and about my sister. So that week, my sister was in the rec room with her friends, and he approached her and said to her, uh, uh, you know, his name, he says, my name's Ernie Kaufman, and uh, uh, I, I, I know you're here. You joined up with your sister. I, he says, I met her at the uh, synagogue, and, uh, and, and you, would you like to go out sometime? And Connie at the time was being courted by another young man, and, but he was going to be discharged, and uh, his time was up. And 
So she hemmed and hawed, and so he let it go. So when the young man that she was seeing did get discharged, which was only two weeks later, Ernie moved in, and, and he asked her out, and they went out, and they hit it off. Unbeknownst to my sister, the young man who was courting her had gone to New York. That's where he lived. He came back for her. He was going to get a job in Florida to be near my sister. Well, my sister was in a dilemma because now she really liked Ernie. So what was she going to do? So she left it up to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so he came to the house the young man came to the house his name was Shelley and he said what's going on here he said you know I invited all of you you and your sister and your husband to, to come for banana pancakes and you never showed up he said you know I had the batter made and everything he said what, what's that all about because he had found himself a little apartment so I, I told him what happened. I told him what happened. I said, she never knew you were going to return. And she got attached to some other man. And he was heartbroken. And you know, when he left, he was going to go home the following two days. When he left, I thought, this was such an ego trip for my sister. It's something she needed. This was really wonderful because my sister was always shy with men. Always shy. And... It was. It was the ego trip my sister needed. And uh, Ernie, of course, seeing the competition, was hurrying up. Yeah. So it was very, really nice. Anyway, they got married the following year. I got married in 52, and they married in 53. You got to accentuate to positive. That wasn't my idea. As much as I loved my mother and father, I really didn't want the small town. I had been to Philadelphia, where Jake was from. I loved Philadelphia. It's very much like like New York. Very exciting, beautiful, big city, metropolis. But my husband, for some odd reason, he loved the way my parents treated him. He loved the small town. He loved that whole thing. Because you can't get into the head of someone else. No matter even what they tell you, it's still not everything. It's not everything. So, as a young bride, to make him happy, we moved back to Lawrence. And uh, a lot of things happened. We went into business. He didn't like it. Then he went to school. And uh, he was dissatisfied with that. And uh, then he went to work for um, a big, um, big company, Raytheon, that made the missile that, you know, the Hawkeye, Hawkeye missile. And after five years there, they laid off 7,000 people, all within two weeks. It's awful. So we went to live in Philadelphia with his parents. We sold our home, so we had money to, to buy another home. And we moved to Philadelphia thinking he was going to work with his father. His father owned a, a his, his self-employed uh, a termite company. And he had, he was doing pretty well. He had a lot of um, sh stops, uh, shops and uh, uh, theaters and things where he serviced them. And he also sold the chemical from his own garage to people. He had a, a garage where he kept all his supplies and his chemicals. <clears throat> so Jake thought he'd work with his father, but his father really didn't like his son working with him because his father <laughs> worked without books. And Jake was an accountant. He had gone to school for two years as an, to study accounting. And he liked to have books. He liked to know what was coming in and what was going out. And his father did not like that. So his father told him, and he wanted his son out of 
out of his business. So it, it, it was bad. It was bad. So at the time, my brother and my brother-in-law, they bought a lot, a lot of property in Lawrence, Massachusetts that were pretty bad. So they told Jake, if you help clean them up and build them up so that we can rent them, we'll give you a job with us. So he became their maintenance man. And that worked for two years. And then one New Year's Day, my brother called a family meeting and we all went to his house and we all sat around. What was going on? What was going on? My brother said, what do you say? We all moved to California, all of us. And, you know, what was that coming from? He says, well, I got such bad knee problems. I can't even walk this cold, this snow. It's, it's just killing me. And which means I have to sell my property, which means both Ernie and Jake are not going to have jobs. So what do you say? We all move to California and try to find work there. And that's how come we all came to California. Everybody came to California. It's very nice. Yeah, and we liked California right away. The weather, the people, more liberal, uh, more tolerant, and many different uh, stations of life and, and uh, religions. And you learn to accept more in California. You don't, I remember my kids going to school and saying to me, Mama, the teacher wants to know who we are what we are. And I would say, what do you mean? You're a child of God. No, they want to know what religion we are and what our, our nationality. I said, you're American. Well, they want to know the background. I said, okay. I didn't want to say that my husband was Jewish because I knew right away those Laurentians would kill him. So I said, which, which is true that he was of Russian, Russian Jewish descent. I said, say it, Russian and Italian, but I'm American and I'm a child of God. My poor kids went with a litany of a speech, ready made. <laughs> Until today, they laugh about it. I had four children, and each of them are the blessed star of my life. Whenever things, I, whenever I feel a down for anything, whether it be the outside world or the inside world bothering me, I just have to remember having my four stars in my life. You know, like when you're a kid and you see the star on your paper and you go home happy? That's what makes me happy, the stars. I have four stars on my paper every day. I, I'm happy just knowing they're there. My two daughters are my angels by my side. My two sons are not at my side, but any time I call them, they're there. And that's wonderful to know. My first book is called Once Upon a Recipe. And you know how I tell you I like to cook and all the recipes my father taught me how to cook? Well, they're all in here. And things I invented myself from trial and error. You know, some of them didn't come out so good. They're not in the book. And, so, and the good ones are. The good ones are. Good days, bad days economically. Struggling days. Days when the pay was great. So they're all in here on how to make your money uh, stretch. Your, 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 your food stretch with the little money or good days when you can have filet mignon. Each recipe, most of them anyway, have a, a drawing that myself and all my children and my husband uh, drew uh, depicting the recipe. It, they, they, they're quite cute and clever. And the story of how the recipe came And the story. Each, each recipe has a story of how the recipe was found. See, each, so most of them have a, a picture, and a, each one has a story. It took me, it took me 
six years, really. First, I had to go to school to learn how to write. I like to write, but I needed to f f uh, make it so that it was uh, commercially readable. The other one was almost like a journal, and I wanted to write in a commercial way. So I went to school for two years by mail with two editors from New York City. And uh, they helped me a lot. They were wonderful. And uh, I wrote this novel called Long Way Home, uh, Lucy Calvert, myself. And uh, as I said, it's semi-biographic, and the rest is just fantasy. But it's things that I had to research because it tells about uh, from radio to television, and how how television the she uh, she she she's a singer who actually gets into television by way of singing in a musical, uh, which all girls dream about, and uh, how the television was created in those days, and New York City, the hubbub of it, and how it affected a young girl, and also a big beautiful romance takes place of someone she meets in her hometown and then he changes his life for her and then she finds that she has to now change her life for him the career wise so it's a very beautiful love story with lots of information about she's just uh, preteen during the world war two days, but it describes those days and how it was, it affected the families of Lawrence. And, um, and, um, and it goes into in the, the sister has a romance with a soldier. And it's very lovely. So if you enjoy a good read, as they say, you'll enjoy my novel. Mm -hmm.